Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today, we are on location in Brattleboro, Vermont, and we are seated with the author of this book, Dr. Michael Conforti, Field, Form, and Fate. This is a very interesting book, and Dr. Conforti is a very special man. He's a Jungian analyst. He used to be very deeply involved in psychodrama, actually through which we met many years ago. And he is the founder and director of the Assisi Conferences and Seminars, which take place in Assisi, Italy, as well as in Vermont and other locations across the world at this point. Michael has been a pioneer in Jungian analysis and expanding that form to include many other different forms of inquiry and has been really innovative in bringing different levels of thought and consideration to understanding the human psyche and how to not just theoretically but practically work with people so they can move along their own spiritual and psychological pathways. So we're very glad to have Michael on the show today. A lot of his work dovetails so beautifully with what we do on A Better World in helping people expand their consciousness, transform it, and understand as consciously as possible what their lives are about, their sense of purpose, direction, belonging, and meaning. So, Michael. Thank you, Mitchell, very much. So great to have you. Great to be here. It's been a long time in the making, huh? Yes. But finally, we're so glad to have you. So first of all, how is it, what was that initial inkling in you that had you know, actually at this point, long ago, that you wanted to go into this field of psychology? I think the first thing was I worked at a state hospital in New York, Willowbrook State Hospital. That's the one mm. Geraldo Revere did the expose on oh, God, back in the yes. 70s. And I went there, and these student, the students, these uh, patients were yeah. in very bad shape. They were there for 20, 30 years. And there was this one little boy would go out every day. And that recess, he'd go out to the flower gardens and get the flowers, and he would literally make a crown to put on mm. his head. And there was a sense of joy this kid had. I mean, in this dismal life, these kids. I mean, it was just abysmal what happened there. But in that one 15, 20-minute time period, he put this thing on. He was transported to another domain. And I thought, you know, if I could only find someone to understand mm. what was happening for him, was it some symbolic <laughs> attachment? Not that he was thinking about it, but there was something that he was trans or another domain he was transported to. And I never forgot that. Mm. And it made such an imprint on you that... 40 years ago, the curiosity years ago. of the psyche yeah. <laughs> became so utmost. Yeah. And then you went and you studied psychodrama, as I had mentioned, mm -hmm. and Jungian thought. And then you graduated from the New York Jung Institute. Mm -hmm. And you went on to be in practice privately up here in Vermont. Over 25 years' work, yeah. That's right. And then you began the Assisi seminars. Now, what was it that drove you to, to do that? What I mean, you get a very full education being a Jungian. You know, he's one of the wider, greater, more expansive thinkers of all. Was there something that you were not getting from that? I could tell you the story. OK. <laughs> I, part of the training, you're in supervision groups at the Institute in New York. And I, I had a great training. I, I, I adore what happened to me at the training. I had very good teachers and colleagues and all. So it was a wonderful time. But I, I remember, as we used to be in class talking about our cases, it seemed to be that whatever we talked about, the problems with our patients, whatever, it described more about the candidate than about the patient. And I'd be there scratching my head saying, my God. The Jungian student. The, the trainees. Yeah, the trainee. And myself included. Right. Said, my God, you're <laughs> that, you're like that, or you're like that. And there was one case. In Mirrors <laughs> facing each other. <laughs> it was just, it was comical, and I was just you know, perplexed by this. Is this just selective uh, presentation of cases or whatever? And then the, the most dramatic one was somebody presented a case uh, where a patient had a dream, where the therapist was speaking in Latin and Greek and, and, and all of this. I thought you could even speak this. And uh, the patient, after the dream, he said, you know, you seem to me to be as uh, authentic as a Hallmark greeting card. And the, and the student therapist said, the patient's trying to destroy me. They're envious of me. They, they, I know about the language of the gods and archetypes and all, and they just can't take it because they don't have much of a life there themselves. 
So the senior analyst said, I think you're right. This is clearly a case of uh, attacking you. And, and, uh, and I, you know, here I am. I'm a kid from Brooklyn. I was, I was 26, <laughs> 27 years old. I said, you know what? I think the patient's right. You are as a, well, I think it's a Hallmark <laughs> reading card. And I think you just speak in Latin and Greek, and not that you even speak Latin. You know, sure. They didn't have the ability to speak these languages anyway. I said, even if you could do it, the patient wouldn't understand it. So what good is it? I think the patient's got your number. <laughs> and everybody in the class turned and said, oh, here we go. The Sicilian is a little angry and starting trouble. By the end of that class, the senior analyst said, my God, I think you're right, Michael. Because if you're speaking a language that the patient can't understand, what good is it? Whose narcissism is it? And I said, so I went back to one of my supervisors, uh, a man I have deep regard for, Dr. Kaufman. I said, Dr. Kaufman, what's happening here? I mean, I, it seems like the patients are saying things about the analyst that's accurate, and no one ever talks about this. He said, you have to meet this man, Robert Langs. And I called him up. And uh, I didn't know anything. The famous and Robert the Langs. The famous that Robert is. Langs. And thank God I, I didn't any know anything. Any graduate students in psychology, <laughs> right? You didn't know anything about anyone I, would study, actually. I think the book Fear and Trembling was really built, was really written in response to being with Langs back then. This <laughs> is in the 80s, you know. And uh, it was a profound experience. He said, first, uh, well, who are you? He said, I'm a Jungian analyst. He said, well, you don't want to work with me anyway. The Jungians don't like me, but the Freudians don't like me. And he said, do they have trouble with my work? And I said, well, what is it? He said, Patients understand the truth about the therapist's psyche. I said, I got to work with you. Mm. That was the beginning. So, you know, I I, Jung understood, uh, I think Jung understood the, the innermost workings of the human psyche better than anybody. He didn't capture the interactional piece. Mm. And that was the beginning for me. And I said, you know, these, these pieces of work are so closely aligned, um, but it wasn't brought into my training, so I had to go out of the institute. And That's it was a very difficult time period. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know why I was doing it. You know, when you're caught in the, in the throes of a creative process, I mean, now I can say it was creative. It, it was quite agonizing. I felt totally polarized. Sure. Because you got the Jungian on this side. you got the, the Langsy, which is really very psychoanalytic on this side. I, I didn't know where I stood. It's so interesting. For people who are not in the field, um, but standing outside and maybe have gone to a therapist here and there or even a Jungian here or there or Freudian, don't have any real idea of the intricacies oh. of relationship, the details involved, and the politics involved. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's rather, rather remarkable what really goes on and the internal workings of it. And it actually gives us a little bit of pause, like if these guys can't get along, <laughs> then how is the rest of the world going to get along, you know? I'd like to move, Michael, into uh, another domain um, because your work has taken so many quantum leaps forward in so many ways. And what you've done in this book by bringing forth the idea, that essentially the quantum physical idea of fields mm -hmm. Into the uh, into the clinical setting, um, I'd like you to expand a little bit on that, if you would, because I think it's bringing a new wave of understanding well, to the to the subject. Okay, I can pick up at the last part with uh, working with Langs when I looked at the interactions, because what I was interested in was the initial interview, the first sessions, and I found there was this again an uncanny happening that would occur on a regular basis in first sessions. And that whatever the patient would bring to therapy, whatever the issue was, it would inevitably get reenacted with the therapist doing something which was something similar to the patient's problem. Now, people that had, uh, had been traumatized by incest, there were inevitably boundary problems that came up between patient therapists. People like that what would that be like, a boundary well, problem? Uh, th they may say to the therapist, would you sit closer to me? Would you hug me after the sessions? Would you give me your home number in case I have a really rough time? Could you give me extra sessions? And, and these are things therapists don't think about as being what I would now call field phenomena, field-generated uh, interactions. So anyway, I began to see that when somebody would come to therapy, there was something else already at work. I mean, we look at the patient who comes to a therapist, and they begin talking, and the therapist helps them with the issue. I saw, no, there was something else at work. There was something that was really designing interactive dynamics in which the patient was already embedded. The patient was embedded in what I would call a field now, where there were certain behaviors, certain tendencies, certain interactive dynamics that was so incredibly choreographed and coherent 
that it would inevitably bring the therapist into the field with them where they were both doing a certain kind of dance. So here we find patient therapists enacting a dance where there was some version. I don't mean literal incest or whatever, but there's mm -hmm. some version of it. Or somebody who's been orphaned, it's inevitable the therapy would, would have components of it where the therapist would clearly abandon. And there are uncanny cases we could talk about in, in this interview where that this stuff happened. You mean that the, the patient would set up a situation in which he would feel you or see, she would that's feel it's abandoned? Not, no, it's, this is how it's even above and beyond the patient. What I'm saying is everybody is embedded in the field, mm -hmm. much in the way we talk about astrological constellations. Mm -hmm. You can't say the patient set up the constellation. When you look at somebody's behavior and say, my God, it, that really seems to capture the constellation of a Sagittarian or a, a whatever, mm -hmm. it might be cancer mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's the same as these fields. So it's, it's so transpersonal. Say somebody who's been orphaned, they don't go about con consciously or even unconsciously trying to recreate these dynamics. They are literally embedded in a field, such a highly choreographed and patterned field. that They're just living out of it. They're living out of it, and they're possessed okay. by this. And that's when I said, my God, what is it that has a capacity to shape experiences like this? And I began what has now been you know, over a 20-year study of looking at um, everything from embryology to mathematics to dynamical systems mm. to particle physics to see. Mm. And my question was, what is it has a capacity to reconfigure matter? And what's the best answer what we see? And I've been working with, with some of the leading <coughs> figures in the world and mm -hmm. in these different fields. Mm -hmm. fields. And you know, you play the Mr. Wizard game with the magnet and iron filings. Yes. You know, indeed. you put a magnet under here and iron filings on a table. And they align. And they align to something. And you know what? It's not so different. It's not so different in human interactions. Sure. Where sure. you begin to literally see interactions in one's life responding to the prompts of some archetype and some field. So it's really field generated interactions. So it began with Langs, and now I see by working with people from these other disciplines that understand the nature of fields. It's, it's such more of a profound set of dynamics. But underlying any field, Michael, has to be some governing idea. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, there is some kind of thought that has an electricity to it, by the way, yeah. a bioelectricity, yeah. if you will, or an idea that creates that alignment, yeah. whether it's in a field or in, in a human body. And it's better to understand a human body as a field anyway that's really what it is. It might be the cross-sections of several fields or planes, if you will. You know, Mitch, I, I've been reading a lot of Elie Wiesel's work lately, and, and I'm just so captivated by his experiences and how, how he tried to metabolize it. And the way he talks about many of the, even the survivors that after liberation, they mm. commit suicide, how can you understand that, that there was something so, oh God, it was just so powerful about the experience that took over their life. Now, can you say it's, it's, it's simply their trauma, it's their sadness, it's their misery that would keep them in a the field where inevitably the drama of horror and, and annihilation is enacted every day? How many of these people, their lives, his book, The Accident, is a perfect illustration of this, of a field theory, mm -hmm. where the life of this person, and so many people have been through traumas, of course, no traumas like the camps or like what goes on in Rwanda, I, right. I realize that. But people that have been through these severe traumas, their life rotates around this series of dynamics and it goes on and on and on for 50 or 60 years. Mm. And you're never going to tell me it's because of learned, it's not a learning theory, it's not a developmental theory. Because I don't think any of those theories could really explain how it is we draw to our situations that uh, repeat a lot of my work is looking at reiterative dramas or iterations. Yes. There's something that, as you said, galvanizes an event. That is a pivot. It's an archetype. As we were talking about the other day, yes, it's an archetype. And an archetype ultimately is an idea. It's an image. Mm -hmm. It's an idea. I mean, there are people doing work with the language of the human mind. And the language doesn't seem to be a linguistic language, right. but an imagistic language. So that's, as Jung talked about the archetype as an inherited image. Could you expand on that I, idea? I think it goes beyond even image because there are so many examples now from the new sciences that talk about an innate order which is inherent in, in systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, the work, some of the work you know of Hans Jenny in cymatics. 
mm -hmm. where you have this sand on a, on a, on a, on a platter, plate, on mm -hmm. a plate, you run some vibrations through it, and suddenly you have a particular form emerging. Uh, like says a this, mandala or it, what have you. It, it, it's, it's almost uncanny. <laughs> a crop circle. <laughs> well, what you begin yeah. to find is these designs are inherent, and they will respond to a certain kind of harmonic prompt. Right. So it's more than an idea. See, I'm going even further with this, and I'm saying more than an idea. Archetypes have a certain physical reality. Complexes have a certain physicality to them. Mm -hmm. And you begin to oh, see yes. the way they shape even emotions of a person. They shape the interactions. They shape the configurations that design between people. When you're in a complex, excuse me, but your body changes. Your face changes. At times the eyes begin to change of color course. a little bit. It's a type of possession. And this is why I'm saying it goes above and beyond idea. It's platonic in the sense of there's an idea that's primary. And I am the first to talk about with Jung and agree 100% right. about the primacy of the archetype, but it goes even further. Well, I understand, and this is one of the beauties of the name of the Assisi Conferences, mm -hmm. really. Thank you. Which is uh, matter and spirit in the psychotherapeutic context. Yeah. At least that's what it began when that's I right. taught there up 10 years ago, yeah. right? And is it still that? I mean, you're always looking at the relationship of spirit into matter, if you will. Is that is We're that looking correct? at that the confluence. The confluence the of confluence, psyche and matter. Right. And in many ways, you're looking at matter as incarnation. Well, this I was just going to write on that, Michael, to say that in my worldview, there isn't anything that doesn't have a physical correlate. Exactly. I mean, but nothing. And if you really want to go back in time, the Taoists say the same thing yeah. from ancient China literally 5,000 years ago that all spirit is represented in matter. And in fact, what is spirit other than materialized intelligence? I just picked up a very old alchemical text. Therefore, you couldn't possibly have an archetypal image that doesn't have a physiological correlate. You see, exactly. And this is where all the great people, from in the Bible, the word made flesh. Yes, exactly. You have Jung, archetype, and symbol. You have Irvin Laszlo talking about the psi field and matter. You've mm -hmm. got Sheldrake talking about morphogenetic, morphogenetic fields and fields. form. Very true. <laughs> you know? And uh, Hello, are people uh, getting it? <laughs> David Bohm's his yeah. entire work is on the explicate you got the implicate order which expresses itso itself through explication. Right. Now it's you know, a theme that continues to repeat in ancient times through various religious or spiritual contexts, as well as psychological, yeah. as well as in physics. Yes. And I'll tell you how far it goes in terms of clinical work, whether, whether clinical or our work as parents or as colleagues or yeah. uh, consultants. Take the role of pathology. Now, I taught pathology in graduate programs, master's, doctoral programs, analytic institutes, and I'm pretty good at it. I mm -hmm. can diagnose and make a prognosis and the DSM-4 or whatever it is today. And I realize it's... Don't tell me all of my problems at once. <laughs> <laughs> I realize basically the whole notion of pathology is useless. Now, it may sound oh, heretical. I'll tell yes. you why, though. When you look well, and say, that's being heretical isn't nothing right. new to you. When so. This is your TV show, <laughs> yeah. But when you say it's pathological, you're saying this behavior really deviates from a norm. It doesn't fit our, our normative model. Expectations, et cetera. Now, you know how, where we go with this. You take any behavior, no matter how perverse or bizarre it may seem, it's got history. It's been expressed somewhere. I mean, take examples of, of piercing, body piercings, and, and they tattooing, may, tattooing what have you. or when they do the, the piercings of breasts and all that. And people can say, well, it, analytic interpretations, it's self-hatred, it's the masochism. the masochism and all this. Well, you know, they're all clever and interesting and partially right. Mm -hmm. You know what Einstein said it best? He said, it's not that our answers are wrong. He said, our questions aren't big enough. Mm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And the other person that gave us a clue to this is de Chardin when he said, matter is spirit moving slowly enough to be seen. <laughs> is that beautiful? Oh, wow. So then you take a piece of yeah. behavior, like the uh, Piercing. piercings and all, and we ask a different question. We say, OK, it may not be really generative in the individual's life, but what is it? What, what can I know about that behavior from history? You see where, where I'm going mm -hmm. with it? That you begin to see that this archetypal field has suddenly taken over somebody and drew you, have drawn you into a field. Remember the movie Richard Harris in the 70s, A Man Called Horse, with the, it was a sun bear 
the sun bear ritual, mm -hmm. when they take the bear. Sundance. Sundance, thank you. This, where they take the bear claws mm -hmm. as part of the initiation to make yeah. this man worthy to be married to the. It's initiation. Uh, yeah. This is an ancient rite. Definitely. Now, not that kids understand this today. I mean, you look at uh, suspension practices and all sure. this, and people are literally being suspended by hooks and all this. And, and you realize, my God, this is an archetype that's been there almost in the beginning of time, sure. now coming full force, taking over exactly. the individual. When people enact it, they don't get it, whether in the sexual domain or any type of possession. They don't understand it. And it takes somebody to begin to help you articulate the pattern. What you're saying is that there are historical antecedents to all of these things that we might have otherwise called in the pathological model exactly. bizarre, perverse, extreme, pathological, yeah. etc. And what you're also saying is not only are there historical antecedents, but also um, there is a sense of reenactment from the past that is part of our inherited human nature. Exactly. And it will, I mean, talk about iterations. Yep. Here we are, but cross-culturally that is happening as well. So it's part of the Jung's idea of a collective imagery yep. in the collective psyche that we are all banking on and being, in a sense, informed by. Yeah, and you see what, it's it very what a disservice it does to call this thing pathological. Exactly. No, I'm not Pollyanna. You know, like you, we grew up Sure. in the streets and all this. Uh, <laughs> and I see reality for what yeah. it is. Oh, yeah. But I understand that there's something with potential meaning in these activities. It was just someone would give oh, a key and yeah. say, you know what, this behavior has a certain oh, yeah. purpose in it. Sure. But, you know, I'll tell you, to move away from the whole psychoanalytic model, yeah. which I did many, many years ago, and studied with Richard Bandler, Neuro Linguistic Programming, one of its founders, yeah. he said... Everything has a context. Yeah, that's it. Everything, every action, every behavior is context specific. So if you can see it that way, in a sense, there's nothing wrong about anything it's as long as it's in the appropriate context, yeah. in a connected context, if you will. So, you know, I'm just saying that yeah. as, a, as a counterpoint, you know, but totally complementary counterpoint to what you're saying, but you came to it from your view, which is actually more special because you're steeped in the field, and he was a computer programmer. And you know, yeah. it's interesting though. You know, but so that you came to this point of really understanding that there is no norm, and what a radical idea that is. Well, context. How is it being, right. Let me jump in one second because Please. I think what we tend to do in life is we try to make our own context all the time. We have a personal context. Yes. And I think that it does a real disservice to nature because nature has its own ways. The greatest biologist, we've got a woman, uh, May Wan Ho, one of our faculty, she's mm. doing just what you've met her. She's I haven't, but have I know of her. Just brilliant work. Yes. And what all these pioneers are studying are the actual ways nature goes about expressing itself. Its dynamics, its processes. So you know what we do, and like Jung said it beautifully, he said what we tend to do with images is that we, we provide the context. We yeah. interpret, we give meaning to it. He said, but that's not what we need to do. He said, there's inherent meaning. Why don't we let the image express itself? Are we going to impose something on nature? Why don't we just sit and watch how the mushrooms grow, where the mushrooms, what, what, they're, what they need? What time of year they grow? What kind of conditions? What kind of soil? It's, and I can't tell you that in, in so many ways this has changed me and why mm. we're looking at things. Because it forces you to be much more receptive, much more of a sense of uh, deep regard for the natural world and the psyche. And you realize that many times our egos and the way we do things are really at odds with the way the psyche is trying to drive things. Well, look at what we have done to the very planet itself, yeah. Mother Nature herself. I mean, it seems like man can't invent enough ways to destroy, exploit her yeah. and defile her. I mean, if that isn't an expression of the kind of thing you're kind of talking about, of not being observant, not being witness, <laughs> and not being yeah. in tune with, I don't know what is, yeah. you know? Uh, no, I... I appreciate very much what you're saying, Michael, and I think it's very powerful. And I actually came up with a whole view of psychology many years ago that I incorporated into my work, which was called echo psychology, mm -hmm. where instead of dealing with the individual mother, 
part of the archetypal mother for me was Mother Nature herself. And I didn't feel like someone was actually healthy until they left therapy with a positive regard for the planet, deep abiding respect. Yeah. Do you know? I, I agree 100%. Otherwise, you're still wrapped in some kind of self-absorbed, narcissistic little world. Exactly. You think you're so enlightened or individuated or whatever, and you're still out there polluting. and then Exactly. So. so you have a good relationship with your mother. I'm really glad to hear it. And your wife. I'm really glad to hear that, too. But you're destroying the planet with, with your business enterprises or whatever it may be, or littering even. Yeah. It's the whole gamut. So I'm so pleased to hear your watching your process, which I've had the joy of doing for all of these years, and, and expressing a psychology which has just been so expanded under your auspices mm -hmm. that you're, you're bringing a different level of understanding. You've wedded something I, I'm so fond of, physics and biology back to the psychological context. Well, it's the way Jung went to alchemy. You're looking for further amplifications for the yeah. different ways psyche goes about expressing itself. Exactly, exactly. And oh, that quote of Chardin is just it beautiful? fabulous. That's just, that really captures it. Yeah. So I just want to let people know you're running these seminars in Assisi. You've been doing it since 1989. Mm -hmm. They're also taking place in Vermont, Florida, and you run a graduate program as well? We have a training program, a two-year program, and we're starting a three-year training program as well right now for clinicians and consultants. We're doing a lot of, it's getting so diverse from consulting. We had more time to work with taking this into the cinema, working with people in Hollywood right now. Oh, but yeah, we have seminars, fabulous. we've got training programs. Um, Wonderful. Well, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart oh. for the pioneering work. You know, you've just had courage and you've not said no to anyone. You've just followed your heart. And that, to me, is an example for everybody to, to witness. If I say so, no, we don't uh, have to stop? <laughs> Richard, thank you very much. Thank you, my Thanks. friend. Thanks. Great to see you. Pleasure. You had a chance to gain a bit of insight, a window into the workings of the psychological field in a way that really no one else I know has been doing for this length of time and with this level of expansiveness. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World, and I look forward to seeing you all next week.